Pheidippides actually means spare the horse. Why kill off a horse when you can just send him to run there? He was trained to run for long distances. You know, maybe in his head, he was just saying, damn, you know, this is a tough day at the office. <laughs> it's another, another business trip for me. This is Running For Real, the podcast for runners who know that for every runner's high, there are just as many lows. All those just missed PRs, easy runs that feel hard, injury blues, and more. Each week, we'll talk to running, health, and wellness experts about their highs, lows, and best advice to build our confidence. Running For Real is about being honest, being brave, and most of all, not feeling alone. And now here's our host, who loves her dad's apple crumble. Tina Muir. Hello, my friends. Welcome to episode 81 of Running For Real. Thank you so much for joining me today, whether you are a first time listener, if you are a Dean fan or a previous listener, welcome back. Thank you so much for being loyal. If you are a fan of this podcast, either after today or after many, many episodes, the best way you can show that is by subscribing through your favorite podcast player. So it automatically comes to you every Friday. Running for Real is actually now on Spotify as well, which makes it even easier to find. Now, last week we heard from Amelia Gorteca, who is an international runner for Great Britain, and she shared all about her story of becoming one of Britain's best, despite keeping her scoliosis hidden. Now, the reason I wanted Amelia on is that she's so real and she didn't hold back with us at all, sharing the struggles she has been through, especially those of her recent injuries. And although her PRs are a heck of a lot faster than most of us, I felt that she was really relatable. And if you missed that one, you can go back and check it out. Now, today we have the one and only Dean Karnazes, and I'm so excited for this interview. Honestly, going into it, I was a little bit nervous. I mean, it's Dean Karnazes, for God's sake. Although I told him before the interview that I actually didn't know that much about him other than he was ultra marathon man and what I learned about him in his new book, which we're actually going to talk about today. But by the end of this interview, I was in awe of Dean. He was very real with us, even sharing some vulnerable things that he's never shared before in any of his interviews. I hope you enjoy this conversation as much as I did. So let's go meet Dean. You know, I genuinely care about the brands that I choose to share with you. That's why I turned down a big brand recently as I really dislike their product, so I backed out. But I'm so excited to introduce you to a new sponsor, Bomber Socks. It is just in time for marathon season and I'm always telling you that you need to practice with your outfit before the day. Well, now's the perfect time to get some new socks to wear on race day and I'll tell you about why I love them so much later in the show. Thank you to Body Health for sponsoring this episode of the Running For Real podcast. I am so thankful to Body Health and their support, not just of this podcast, but of me through their perfect amino products. They help me recover faster and feel better. You too can get 10% off at bodyhealth.com using code TINA10. Dean, thank you so much for joining me today on the Running For Real podcast. I am really looking forward to hopefully giving you some questions you have never had before, making you think, and uh, we're going to talk about why I want to do that later in the episode. But firstly, thanks so much for being here. Well, thanks for having me on. It, it's my pleasure. It's my honor, actually. Oh, well, that's that's nice for me to hear. And um, I want to start off with a question that one of my uh, Patreon members uh, gave, which was... It wasn't a question she specifically had, but she told me she was in an elevator with you once and she said she would recognize those calves anywhere. Now, in your book that we're going to talk about in a little while, you talked about your family being able to recognize you through your calves. Now, for people like me or those listening who don't really know too much about you, what is it about those calves that are so unique that people could pick you out of a crowd? <laughs> It's, not, it's better than a birthmark, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, I yeah. It. I, you know, it, I, I the only the, the best um, description I can give you is that uh, you know it, if you look at a, a, a papaya, an inverted papaya, and that's kind of what my calves look like. Okay. But I don't want to say it's you know because I'm such a stud and this and that. Um, I think it's a largely hereditary. I I'm 100 percent Greek, mm-hmm. and I you know I visited this village my family's from in Greece. And everyone has calves just like, I mean, they're all my relatives, but they have calves just like mine. Mm-hmm. And they, you know, I think that's because they're chasing goats around the hills of Greece <laughs> for 2,500 years that, um, you know, it's just an adaptation to uh, 
to the mountains there. I mean, everywhere you go, every village you go to is a, is a climb up or down. So there's there's just no flat terrain. Yeah, well, I guess that definitely makes sense. And over time, you know, you, your family has adapted to to make it work. So just kind of cool. And thank you for Emily for giving me the the like kick to ask that question. Now, for people who don't know you. Um, I just want to go a bit backwards in your um, history and then we'll kind of go on to what you've accomplished now. But in your book, uh, Road to Sparta, which I have read, really enjoyed. And I have to be honest with you, I, I said this in email, but to anyone listening, I am not typically an, an English, I'm sorry, in English, I am English, a, um, a historic kind of person. I've never really been that fussed in learning, but I really enjoyed reading about, you know, the story, what happened behind it um, with just everything that you talked about. So even to anyone listening, if it is a historic style book, you may not, that doesn't necessarily put you off, but you talked early on about your start to running and at age 14, running 105 laps of the track, which is a marathon's worth to raise money for library, for a library. And, uh, firstly, that's mind blowing. And, you know, reading must've been really important to you (laughs) to motivate you to do that. But Um, Tell us about, you know, was that where you discovered a love of running? Was that where things really started to click in that this was something that you loved and wanted to enjoy? You know, it's not really where my love of running developed. I'm not sure where that came from, but I know that my first memory as as a human being, as a child, was running home from kindergarten. Really? And I remember very clearly, it's still imprinted upon my mind that, um, you know, I, I had such a hard time sitting through class and as soon as that bell rang, I would start running. Mm. And it was about a mile to run home. <laughs> you know, I was the oldest of three children. And um, my mother, you know, my dad had, uh, he was working two jobs. Um, when my, my youngest daughter, you know, my youngest uh, sister came along, you know, my mother had all, her hands full. So I told her, you know, you don't have to worry about getting me home from kindergarten. Um, I'm just going to start running. And I just love to run home. It just, it felt so liberating. And I felt like I was kind of relating to the world through feeling the, you know, the, the air on my skin. And I remember running, I'd run through a park and I remember the, the lake and the ducks on the lake and how the lease would change um, over the seasons and how the air would grow cooler or hotter or more humid. Mm-hmm. And that's kind of, I, that was kind of how I related to, you know, to, to my place in the world. And then, you know, at 14, when I ran that marathon, I, I saw the, the power in running um, to inspire people. And it was a charitable event, as you saw. And we know that, um, you know, running for good, as I say, for, you know, running for charity for causes like team and training or any of the others um, is very, very popular. And I saw very early on in my life that um, running inspired people and they wanted to get behind a movement, um, you know, the particular movement that was passionate that I was passionate about then was, you know, getting books into the library mm-hmm. because my mom was a, a middle school teacher. So I just, at, at that, you know, that decision to run uh, a marathon around the track was more um, inspired by charity than real passion for running or maybe, a, maybe a mix of both. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. It would have to be. Had you decided before that that was your goal or was it just, you kind of kept going and that was where you ended up? You know, I subtly thought, I wonder if I could do a marathon. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, when I got to 20 laps, I kind of mentioned to someone, hey, I'm going to do a marathon. And, you know, once the, you know, the egotistical 14-year-old um, <laughs> says he's going to do something, you know, and, and all of a sudden there's a crowd now, you know, gathering around of friends and supporters that are like so uh, inspired and awed that I'm doing this. You know, I wasn't about to stop. And, uh, and impressive enough as what it was and, um, you know, well done to you for, for starting that journey. And, and that really kind of was a impressive thing to do at 14 years old. Um, but that being said, you didn't always run, you got a corporate job in the twenties and you talked in your book about feeling empty and then deciding randomly on your 30th birthday to run 30 miles, just like that. So for those listening, um, you know, how does someone go, I mean, not only the 105 laps of a track at age 14, but how does someone go from not really running to 30 miles just in one, in one go, you know, would you say it's genetics? Like, how can you get away with that? Having not really done much prior to that? I I would say it was tequila. (laughs) (laughs) And I'm not kidding. I mean, I started off drunk and ended up sober. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, I mean, it was, you know, to your point, I um, I stopped running pretty much, um, I, I, you know, when I turned 15, I stopped running. And, you know, I went to college, I went to graduate school, and then I went to business school and got an MBA. 
And, you know, and, and I had a very comfortable corporate job in San Francisco, you know, with stock options and the company car, you know, 401k matching, um, healthcare, you know, big fat paycheck. And I thought if I had all these things, I, I'd be happy. Like this, this is the prescription for happiness. And, you know, when I turned 30, I realized I was empty. I hated being a business guy. I hated going to meetings in the morning. I hated putting on a suit. It just wasn't me. Um, and on the night of my 30th birthday, you're right. I was in a bar in San Francisco doing what a lot of people do on their 30th birthday. I was getting very drunk with my friends. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I said at midnight to them, I'm leaving. And, you know, they looked at me and said, you know, it's, it's, it's your birthday. Let's have another round of tequila. And I said, no, uh, instead of, you know, drinking more shots of tequila to celebrate, I'm going to run 30 miles right now. And they looked at me and they said, you know, you're not a runner, <laughs> you're drunk. And I said, yeah, I am, but I'm, I'm still going to do it. And I just, I walked out of the bar. I didn't even own running gear, but I remember I had some very comfortable um, jockey underwear on, you know, like some, some briefs <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> that were silk. So I took my pants off and I didn't even have running shoes. I remember they were like Reebok gardening shoes or something. And I just stumbled off into the night. I knew if I ran to a city, I was in San Francisco. If I ran to a city called Half Moon Bay, uh, that was 30 miles down the coast. And I ran all night. I, you know, I sobered up at about mile 10. Mm -hmm. And I thought, you know, what am I doing? But something just felt right. The universe just seemed aligned to me. And, and I kept going and ran straight through the night uh, and made it to Half Moon Bay. <laughs> and um, <laughs> that, was, that was my rebirth into running. Yeah. And, and so, you know, you said you, you joked a lot of it was tequila or maybe that was, you know, uh, a big part of it, but you just mentioned there that you kind of sobered up around mile 10. So what got you to that point? Was it just, I want to do something that feels worthwhile? What allowed you to keep going? You know, there was, there was no real struggle in my life. Everything was convenient and comfortable and easy. Mm -hmm. You know, I was, I was making a lot of money. You know, I was, you were kind of going through the motions. There was routine. I was getting up every morning, you know, shaving, going to the office, getting a paycheck. And, you know, I just saw the writing on the wall. Mm -hmm. I, I, you know, I just, for some reason, had this vision of me as this kind of, you know, balding, overweight 50 year old, you know, maybe driving a red sports car or something and, and just being very hollow. And I thought, I don't want to be that guy. I, I remember running used to it used to infuse my soul. It just, you know, any runner can, I think, relate to that yeah. at some level. There's something about running that, that just, it's some primordial sort of, I don't know, fulfillment that we get when we run. And I wanted that feeling back. I wanted actually the pain and the struggle mm. uh, of doing something remarkable. And I remember running that marathon, how badly it hurt and how much I wanted to stop and how I willed myself to keep going and just that discipline of, you know, just mind over miles. And I long for that. And, you know, I got a taste of that on my 30th birthday. And I, you know, after that, I became a runner. Yeah. And you, and you didn't just get a taste of it. You continue doing incredible feats. And maybe for those who don't know much about you, tell us about some of your biggest accomplishment before the uh, Spartato Spartathon, which we can talk about in a minute. Yeah. Well, I mean, I've run on all uh, seven continents of earth uh, twice now. Mm -hmm. So I've, you know, I've run 135 miles nonstop across Death Valley in the middle of summer. Um, I've run a marathon to the South Pole. I, uh, I went to ran 50 marathons in all of the uh, the 50 U.S. states in 50 consecutive days. Mm -hmm. um, you know, <laughs> I've done crazy things. I mean, I, I ran for 24 hours uh, on a treadmill uh, on a two-story platform in, in the middle of Times Square uh, as a charity fundraiser. So I've, I've really taken running, you know, to, to another level as far as exploration. For sure. I've also served as a um, U.S. athlete ambassador. So I've been sent on uh, sports diplomacy envoys to Central Asia and South America. So I've also, um, you know, served as an ambassador um, through running, which I think is, is pretty unique. Oh, and, yeah. You know, no one's ever done that before. So absolutely. And, and someone that, you know, so many of us look up to with what you've been able to do. And, um, what is, what are some words that come to mind when you reflect back on all those things that you've done? Um, uh, surprising, mm. um, you know, still, I, I look at my life and I, it's almost like I'm looking at someone else like, really? 
that is what it, what I've done has been so cool. And I, I mean, I go through my, you know, like I've got a little trophy room in my house, and when I go down there and look at all the awards and the medals, you know, and the trophies, it's almost like I'm peering into someone else's life. Yeah. I, it it amazes me to see all this stuff and think that one man compiled all this. And I'm kind of humbled and awed by it. And I still, I guess, don't accept that it's it's me that has had all these experiences. Mm-hmm. I I guess I feel so fortunate uh, and, and so amazed by it all. Yeah, and I'm not surprised. And and just curious, have you kept pretty much every every award, every trophy, everything you've won, even from the local little things? Or uh, is it only the, the prized ones that go in there? You mentioned thousands, but I could imagine at your point you've had, uh, you know, thousands of prized ones. So what what is in there? It's primarily the, you know, the the bigger ones. I mean, if, you know, if I run like a local 5K just to support the event, you know, that one might not end up in there. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, the the one thing that I do keep um, is the fan letters I get. So oh. I get a lot of fan emails and I put those all in a, uh, you know, in a special folder. Oh, wow. But I get a lot of, a lot of letters from kids and, you know, there's been a couple um, sports cards, uh-huh. like trading cards uh-huh. with me as a runner and I, you know, I get I get probably a hundred requests a month for me to sign those with really nice letters from kids. Oh, so I, I keep all, I've got like 10,000 letters in these boxes in my garage that I just, I can't, I can't throw them away. Yeah. I don't know. You know, my poor family is going to have to sort through them all um, <laughs> when I die. But, well, yeah. I, uh, I don't know if you've heard of the book by, I think her name's Marie Kondo and it's talking about like reducing clutter in your life. But uh, the primary thing that she says is, does it bring you joy? And if it brings you joy, then you can keep it. So by the sounds of it, those bring you joy. So I think you're justified in in keeping them there. So, but really cool. Thank you for for sharing those with us. And I'd love to kind of start talking about your, your book that uh, you've recently released, Road to Sparta. Now, for those who do not know, um, tell us about, you know, what it was about this race, what the Spartathon was, for those who don't know uh, what it is and why you would do it. Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, I'm very, very passionate about this book and about the story. And to explain it to the listeners, to anyone listening, you have to um, turn back the clock uh, 2,500 years to 490 BCE. And that is when um, the Persians invaded Greece. And they landed at a place called Bay of Marathon. And there was a battle that took place there between the Greeks and the Persians. And it was really a battle for not just for um, geographical territory, but for for the way humans structure their lives, for, the, you know, democracy versus kind of tyranny. And this new system of rule by the people, the Greeks had um, started to develop. Um, the Battle of Marathon uh, somehow was won by the Greeks. They were outnumbered about... 50,000 to 10,000, but they somehow defeated uh, the Persians and drove them away. And after that point, they sent a, a foot messenger, a, a man by the name of Pheidippides, which you know many marathons have heard of this name, Pheidippides. Mm-hmm. And he ran from the battlefield of Marathon to the Acropolis, and he ran into the Acropolis, and he proclaimed Nike, Nike, or Nike, Nike, which means victory, victory, we are victorious. And just a quick aside, that's where Nike, the footwear company, yeah. got got the name Nike. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and then and then he died. At least that's the legend. Um, and I thought, what a what a magnificent story! That was the birth of the marathon right there. And I wanted to learn more. I wanted to learn the the actual details, you know, of of what took place. And so I embarked on this kind of um, fact finding and dive into history to recreate the original marathon and to learn everything I could about it and to kind of um, write a book that was um, not really historical fiction, but um, a histor- history based on um, an actual written word, actual written fact. And that was the road to Sparta. Mm-hmm. And, uh, it, you know, in that you, you explained obviously about what you just did right there, but it also talked about um, a story that most don't know about um, Pheidippides. So tell us, Tell us about what that was and and why the race you ultimately ended up doing was 153 miles, not just a 26.2 or the 24.8, was it, that it originally was? Um, well, yeah, no, you read the book. <laughs> yeah, I did read the book. And yeah. that's what my listeners know. I, I do read the books when they come to me. So, yeah, tell us more. Yeah, so, you know, 
uh, for anyone listening, you may know the story of um, Pheidippides, you know, running into the Acropolis and, and dying, supposedly running 26.2 miles um, from the battlefield of Marathon to the Acropolis. Well, the true backstory is that prior to that point, um, when the Persians landed at the Bay of Marathon, the Athenians realized they were going to get creamed because, you know, the Persians had 50,000 troops, the Athenians had 10,000. They needed reinforcements. And for anyone who's watched the movie 300, you know, you know who is the most badass fighting force in ancient Greek, uh, and that is the Spartans. You know, King Leonidas, this is Sparta. So they dispatched Pheidippides to run from Athens to Sparta to recruit the Spartans into battle. And you're right, that is 153 miles. So the race um, that has survived that is called the Spartathlon. And that's a modern incarnation of what Pheidippides did uh, in 490 BCE. And it's a 153-mile nonstop foot race from, from Athens to Sparta. And, uh, and you talked in detail about, you know, doing it uh, yourself, wanting to recreate uh, Pheidippides' historic run. And, uh, you know, I want to go on to kind of talk about a little bit about, about your experience. Obviously, people can read more in the book if they are interested. We'll tell more about how to find that later. But before we get to that, you know, you when you were trying to assess about how you were going to do this, um, you talked about going to Greece, kind of trying to understand what this was going to mean you uh, undertook. And uh, you figured that you couldn't quite do it the way you wanted to, that it would be almost impossible to do exactly what he had done. And you talked about, you know, you wanted to just deal with it, get on with it, kind of move on. Um, but, you know, you and I talked before the interview that this is very much a real podcast and people often see you as like a superhuman, but you talked about you couldn't just get on with it. You couldn't just deal with it. Uh, why do you think that we do struggle as runners with not being able to just move on and kind of let something go when it means a lot to us? <laughs> I think I think we're stubborn by <laughs> by nature. I think any runner is um, inherently stubborn. Uh, you you can't finish any sort of running race unless you're stubborn because you, it takes that sort of you know that that willpower to get you to the finish line. And for me, um, I you know I see the world as black and white. You know I can either I, this is either going to happen or it's not going to happen. And once I say it's going to happen, it, it darn well is going to happen. Mm -hmm. And when I thought maybe it's not going to happen. Uh, I just couldn't accept the fact. And, um, you know, like you said, I, I went to Greece. I did a lot of um, recon, you know, in the hills of Greece, trying to figure out the course that he would have taken. Because, again, this is 2,500 years ago. There, There is no, you know, there's no iPhone to look at mm -hmm. <laughs> to see which way you're going. I mean, he had a he had to navigate um, with, you know, just basic tools of, of line of sight, and, um, you know, trying to do that was, was impossible with the, the network of roads that are now in place and so forth. So I couldn't actually reproduce um, the actual trek that he took, but the closest proximity would be this Spartathlon race, mm -hmm. which a lot of it was on, you know, paved, paved highways, which 2,500 years ago, there, you know, there were no paved highways. And so I decided to, you know, um, to sign up for the Spartathlon race. And I thought, I still want to make this as real as possible because I'm writing about Pheidippides, this guy that ran barefoot, you know, 153 miles uh, to Sparta from Athens. And what was he, you know, what did they eat back then? Mm -hmm. Well, they, eat, they ate um, figs, they ate olives, they ate uh, dried meat, something like beef jerky, and they ate this stuff called pastilli, which is basically ground sesame seeds and honey. It's almost like a gel, like an energy gel. Mm -hmm. And they only had water. I mean, obviously, they didn't have any sort of um, electrolyte replenishment. There was no Gatorade 2,500 <laughs> years ago. <laughs> so I thought, I've got to run this entire race using just those same foods because I want to see if it's, if it's possible. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, we're going to talk about that in just a second. But before we get to, to that, you know, um, once you were on the run itself, on, on the Spartathon, um, you know, going along, things started to go wrong pretty early in the race, uh, when, especially when your crew couldn't get to one of the checkpoints at Megara. Um, and 
you know, just before we get to the kind of food aspect, because I think that is really important to mention, you know, you talk there about uh, we're told to learn from our mistakes, but how many of us really do with regards to when your crew couldn't get to the checkpoint, you could have run back just a little bit just to go meet them, but you decided that you'd rather just go on. Um, So what did you mean by that when you said we're told to learn from our mistakes, but how many of us do? Because again, I think a lot of us beat ourselves up for for not listening to ourselves, for saying, why did I make that same stupid mistake again? So it's good for people to hear that you, you know, being as accomplished as you are, still struggle with that too. <laughs> well, there's a, there's a, a wonderful um, uh, British proverb that I love, and that's a, a stumble can prevent a fall. <laughs> so, you know, a lot of us stumble a lot, and hopefully we have the wisdom to pay attention to where we're stumbling and to avoid that in the future so we don't fall but most of the time we don't. And I think the reason we don't is because we get so caught up in the moment. And and to your point, I mean, I've done hundreds and hundreds of marathons and ultra marathons. And I know that if something goes wrong, you know, waiting for a couple minutes to correct it um, in the scheme of a race that ultimately will take, you know, 30 hours, 30 plus hours, waiting a couple minutes to correct something uh, is is much better than continuing on with something that um, needs to be fixed. But in the passion of the moment, you know, with that bullheaded drive, you sometimes lose sight of that. I mean, you know, people are screaming, patting you on the back. You know, there's other runners are passing you. And it's almost like you're in a 100-yard dash when you, <laughs> you know, when you're running 153 miles nonstop. And so, you know, I just got caught up in the passion of it and thought, okay, you know, you can run another 15 miles without food. That, that's fine. It's just 15 miles. Mm-hmm. And, you know, in the scheme of 153, that's, you know, that's 10%. It's not that big of a, of a of stretch. But then again, you know, I started running and I started thinking 15 miles is a long way to go. Yeah. And it's hot out here. It's, you know, southern Greece. It's uh, relentless. It's hilly. You have nothing to eat. You know, you have the wrong socks on. Uh, but it was too late at that point. I mean, you know, a mile down the road, I realized I made the wrong decision, but I made the wrong decision. You know, that, that stumble didn't prevent the fall. Yeah, for sure. And I think, uh, a lot of us can, can relate to doing things, you know, similar to that. I, I can think of many occasions, uh, Dean, I'm, I'm sure you don't know this, but I, uh, before I just had my baby, I was actually a elite professional runner. And, um, I would often, you know, if I was in a half marathon, I'd be like, Oh, I'm not going to take a sip of water. Cause that's going to slow me down. And I'm going to waste time when realistically it would have been better for me to kind of take water on early. And, <laughs> you know, but it's that ego thing that you just mentioned right there. But so you just said there that you kind of went on, uh, made a mistake, realized you made a mistake, but that wasn't the end of your not eating food, uh, or missing fueling for the rest of the race, you ended up um, running the final 75 miles on just water, no fuel. Um, but then you talked in the book about, um, you know, if you're hungry, you should eat. If you're thirsty, you should drink. Now, you were feeling nauseous most of the time in those final 75 miles to not uh, eat or drink. But for runners listening, what if they say, well, I'm never really hungry. So should I not eat for my marathon or, um, you know, does any part of you wonder now whether it would have been worth you forcing it down, even if you weren't hungry? Yeah, I, I, I think about that, um, quite a bit. And, you know, the, the problem is that I would go out for, you know, six or eight hour training runs, eating only figs and it was fine, mm-hmm. but I didn't ever run for 24 hours only eating figs. And there's a big difference. I mean, (laughs) you know, why do you eat figs typically? A lot of figs is because, you know, you're not regular and you want to become regular. Well, you know, when you're running uh, an ultra marathon, you don't necessarily want to be regular Mm. because, (laughs) and, you know, when, when things started happening with my, you know, my guts, um, that, that's kind of a death spiral. You know, once you lose your guts like that, it's hard to recover. And, and I knew that. And, you know, it was very tempting for me, uh, to, to just grab an energy bar or something else other than another fig or another olive. And, you know, that pretty soon the, you know, the, the olives, I, I just couldn't, you know, that was just too heavy of a taste. 
Um, the cured meat, it was just like chewing on a leather belt. Mm-hmm. I just couldn't get any moisture in my mouth. And I don't know what, ha- I just got this idea that just, just keep, you know, I just thought you're either going to, you're either going to end up on a stretcher in the medic tent <laughs> or you're going to finish this darn race. I mean, I was, I was that determined and I just felt like if I put another something in my mouth, it's going to go right through me. So don't even bother. Just, you know, deal with it drink water (laughs) and keep putting one foot in front of the other. And somehow you did just that. And, uh, you know, we're going to talk more about towards the end, uh, just how much you were struggling and and how far your body went to, to be able to get to that point where you could do it. But um, something else that caught my eye in in the book was um, you talked about at Corinth um, being kind of essentially blasted with media attention, you know, people wanting autographs, uh, you know, cameras being shoved in your face. And this also happened at the end after 35 hours of running. Um, now, being that you were once voted one of the top 100 most influential people in the world, it's not really surprising. But you talked in the book about um, kind of at those points, you were doing it mindlessly. You know, you were just smiling, signing, kind of just essentially getting through it. Um, so for someone listening, you know, myself included, wondering, you know, what does it feel like to be that famous that people are just all around you all the time? You know, I'd love for you to be real with us Um you know, you see it as like your duty is, is what you do, but does any part of you wish that you could just get on with, you know, your stuff in peace? You know, that's a really good question. And I know for so many of you listening to this, it's hard, it's hard to relate to, um, you know, what you just explained and what I'll talk about, because it's very unique to kind of the, you know, the, the Dean experience, if you will. Um, but especially in Greece, uh, you know, I'm kind of a known entity. Mm -hmm. And I have a lot of fans and followers, uh, a lot of relatives, and they came out in force to see me along the route on the Spartathlon. And when I say see me, I mean, these are people that, you know, I'm related to, but I've maybe never met my whole life. And they, Mm -hmm. they feel an intimate bond with me and they bring out their whole family. And, you know, they've never, a lot of them were not runners, let alone ultra marathoners. So, they don't know what it feels like to, to run for 75 miles and, and be swarmed by a group of people all wanting, you know, to meet you, to take a selfie. Yeah. <laughs> you know, a lot of them had copies of my book. They wanted me to sign. And, you know, I come running into an aid station and I'm, I'm shot. I mean, I'm exhausted. I've been running for 75 miles nonstop. All I want to do is get in my own head, you know, just sit there and regroup, maybe try to get some food in me. And that was just not happening. I would show up and there'd be, you know, 30, 40 people wanting to see me. Mm-hmm. And a lot of these people had come, I mean, some people were saying, wow, I, you know, I came from this island to see you. I've been traveling since yesterday. And what do you say to someone like yeah. that? Even though, you know, you're exhausted and you just, you really don't feel like talking to anyone at that particular moment, you know, you're, you're almost kind of happy to see them. I mean, it's, it's this kind of reunion. So it was very conflicted experience. I, I so wanted just to get in my own head and, you know, what I ended up doing at these aid stations, is just giving myself to the people and, you know, taking selfies and signing stuff, not, not taking care of myself. And then finally just getting so overwhelmed, you know, by all this attention, just getting up and saying, Hey, I got to go. Um, you know, thank you for being here and just, and, and just continue running, mm-hmm. not tending to myself at all. And, and that was kind of, you know, the, the situation I was in. And, I know it's so hard for so many people listening to relate to that, but it, I wish I wish there'd been a camera crew shadowing me, and there was for a while that was kind of documenting what was going on. And in fact, I should say there was a camera crew, and there was yeah. there is a movie now called The Road to Sparta, and they actually captured very well. They captured me coming in these aid stations and just being swarmed, and and then tr- and just leaving without really tending to myself at all. Mm-hmm. And I guess not really surprising, you know. I kind of. In my head, I'm kind of almost viewing it as like, um, you know, uh, it's like some some plants trying to like pull you in and, and everyone, you know, they've got good intentions, but, you know, you're just like kind of tr- trying to break free to, to get on with, you know, this task that you're supposed to be doing, especially when it's something that means as much to you as this race did. Um, and, you know, I, the next thing I wanted to talk about is something, you know, quite deep, maybe it's going to hopefully make you think a little bit, but you know, you talked about, um, Pheidippides just doing his job, essentially running the 140 miles and back plus some more, as you talked about in the book. 
Um, but do you think any part of why we say running is so hard, you know, when we're in this moment where we're really struggling and we're trying to just complete what we're doing, you know, maybe not to the extreme of 153 miles, but just someone listening in the middle of a struggle, um, that we kind of dramatize it because it's such a big contrast to the rest of our life. Um, you know, you talked early, earlier on about being in your twenties and life was just easy. Um, do you think that is kind of essentially what we do in our day-to-day lives as life is so comfortable that it makes running seem so much harder. Whereas back then he was just kind of doing his job. That was just, life was never easy for them in any way. So he kind of was toughened up to it, I guess. I don't know if that makes sense, that question. It it, it does. And I think that, you know, (laughs) on several levels, it makes sense. I mean, you know, I think that, you know, he was part of a class of citizens that were called Himo the Romi or just the Romi, which literally translates into day long runners. Mm -hmm. So he was actually trained as a foot messenger. Um, The Greeks realized that in the, you know, the mountainous terrain of Southern Greece, that a trained Romi could outrun a horse um, because they were faster. Mm -hmm. And I know this is true. I mean, I've been in foot races against horses and I've actually beat horses on hundred mile races. (laughs) Um, So, and in his name, Pheidippides actually means spare the horse because, you know, why kill off a horse when you can just send him to run there? So he was trained to run for long distances, and, and that's what he did. You know, we, we always, we, you know, we, we tend to romanticize the story thinking, you know, here's this impassioned guy, you know, running to save democracy. You know, maybe in his head he was just saying, damn, you know, this is a tough day at the office. <laughs> it's another, you know, it's another, another business trip for me. We really don't know, but, you know, to the point of us running, um, you know, marathons or half marathons competitively in this modern day, when we're struggling during a marathon or half marathon, it's very, it's a very unique feeling and sensation to any other part of our lives. Mm. And only runners can relate to that. I mean, you can't, most people don't have such moments of intense pain and uncomfort you know, they just don't, maybe, you know, the closest experience I can think of is, you know, watching my wife give birth. Mm. I mean, in that moment I said, wow, she, she, she's out of it. I mean, she's kind of like I am at when I'm, you know, was running this bar on. And, you know, other than those sort of moments in everyday life, you know, unless we're in a traumatic, you know, accident or something happening where, you know, we get, God forbid we get shot or something, we just don't have those intense, intense moments. Mm-hmm. But when we're running, and like you know, especially when you're running competitively, or not even competitively, I mean, for someone who's non-competitive to complete a marathon, there are moments of supreme doubt and suffering mm-hmm. that you just don't experience in, in everyday life. Uh, exactly. And that's kind of what I was you know, thinking that it is such a big thing. And like you said, it's just such a short window and so different to everything that we go through normally. And you mentioned pain there and you've talked about pain being, you know, essentially a very deep emotional connection as well as a physical one. Um, and you don't actually fear pain, but you say that it makes you feel the most alive, uh, alive and you assign positive feelings to it. So, you know, for someone listening who is thinking, how could that be? How could you ever make pain a positive thing, you know, how can I get to that point? What Do you have any advice for someone who maybe sees pain as, oh no, it's coming, it's coming, here it is. Um, you know, what what can we do to toughen ourselves up to, or maybe it's not toughen yourself up, but what can we do to think that way too? Well, you know, I, I think it's the, it's the fear of pain mm. that holds a lot of people back. And until you can shift your paradigm and say, you know, I'm going to embrace the pain, um, because it's inevitable. There, you know, there's no way to stand at the starting line of a marathon and think maybe this is the marathon where it doesn't hurt. <laughs> it's just, it's not going to happen. Mm-hmm. So I, I say to people, um, you know, shift the paradigm. It's There's going to be a point where you're crying out in pain and you want to stop. That is going to happen. You know, project. When that happens, what are you going to do? You know, where are you going to put your head? How are you going to respond? And I think if you can do that, your relationship with pain changes. Yeah. And is that something you, you practice in, in other areas of your life, like maybe during training, or is that something you can only really do when you're in that race situation? I think you can push yourself to a certain extent to experience some of those emotions when you're training. But I think under a race setting is when, you know, the, those are the strong, the strongest impulses. 
Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Thank you. Now, another thing that was that was really interesting, you know, you talked towards the end of the the race about uh, essentially sleep running, um, and I would love for you to explain to everyone listening about what that was and and how you can be at the point where you're so determined that your body can actually do that and and get away with that. <laughs> <laughs> Don't try this at home, kind of thing. <laughs> You know, it, it, it just happens. It's spontaneous when you're, you know, when you're running, um, continuously, you know, through the night, your, your body just, it shuts down. I mean, you're overriding all your natural instincts to stop and rest. And at a point your body just cannot keep going. And you're right. What happened to me is I, I woke up and realized I was running. It was almost like, you know, when you're, if you've gone through college or university, you remember, you know, cramming all night for a, like a final mm -hmm. and kind of reading a book and all of a sudden, you know, waking up with your head in the book. Mm. It's kind of those things. It's, it's these quick cat naps and, where you just fall asleep and realize I was just asleep. Yeah. And, and that happened to me while I was running. And, you know, that in itself is bizarre, but I think even more bizarre is that after you go through that kind of narcoleptic episode, you actually feel rejuvenated, like your body just needed to reboot itself and it achieved that and you feel like re-energized. You know, that's interesting you mentioned that because I had uh, Courtney Dowalter on the show a few months ago and she talked about uh, during, I can't remember how long the race was, um, it was the longest race she'd done, well over 100 miles, um, I want to say 150 or something like that as well, but um, she talked about... Um, sleeping for one minute, uh, you know, lying down on the ground, sleeping, feeling refreshed, getting up and asking how long it had been. And the, uh, the person who was with her said one minute and she said, Oh, I feel great. Let's go. So, um, she talked about that exact thing, um, feeling rejuvenated just from that one minute. And, you know, it's, it's hard for someone who hasn't been through that to think how, how could that be possible? But hearing you say it as well, I mean, you know, this is kind of the same experience and, and it's very interesting to learn about. I, I doubt most of us would ever get to the point where we could do that. Um, but uh, does it, on that note, does any part of you worry about that, that you could push yourself, you know, as far as Pheidippides did? Um, you know, I've pushed myself so hard that I couldn't remember race, finishing races before um, in marathons and stuff. And, and it kind of scares me looking back that I pushed myself that far. But do you see it that way or is it only a positive thing to you? You know, right now it's, 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 it is, um, the driving force of my life. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I'm at that age that I'm willing to commit entirely to a race. I'm like, it, I'm, you know, I, I, I've had a great life. <laughs> <laughs> I know this sounds almost, um, you know, deter, you know, it, it's, it's almost like, it's not a death wish, but you know, if, if I'm going to go somehow, I might as well go pushing myself, yeah. you know, over the edge. You're at peace with so it. I'm, I, yeah, I'm just, I'm so committed to, you know, I, you know, there's a, there's a quote, um, by a gentleman I really admire and, you know, he, he just said, uh, find what you love and let it kill you. Oh. So I figured I've, you yeah, know, I've found what time. I loved. <laughs> yeah. And I mean, if it, if it, if that's it, you know, if, if my finish line's a pine box, then, then so be it. But, um, I'm, I'm going to keep going until I either pass out on the side of the road or I cross that finish line. <laughs> okay. Well, uh, you know, I, I hope that doesn't ever happen to you, but you know, amazing <laughs> that you've got yourself to that point where you can, you know, be okay with that and just, you know, commit that much to the, to these races. So, you know, you've done over 350 miles in a run before you've done all these incredible things. What made this one so difficult when it was quote unquote, only 150 miles, 53 miles? You know, this, this one I think meant the most to me personally. And, you know, it was the highest stakes I thought of any race for me personally. Um, you know, that was one, that was one level. You know, the second level is I really wanted to recreate this story. Yeah. And I knew that, you know, to write this book, you really need to, you need to put your, your head in the place, um, that Pheidippides head was in. And maybe I achieved that through this extreme exhaustion. Maybe I got a Amazing. taste of, <laughs> Yeah, I'm, I may be able to, you know, to to write a, a more honest tale of of what he might have gone through. So that was on my mind. You know, the other element I, again is this kind of um, bizarre, you know, quote unquote celebrity sort of uh, experience yeah. that was happening to me along the way. 
So there's just so many um, unique and kind of, you know, uh, different sort of um, emotions coming through my through my uh, my mind as I was running this great distance. Uh, that it was, you know, it was just a combination of so many things that came together that that really um, elevated the experience. Mm-hmm. And I think really, um, you know, when a race goes horribly bad, like it went for me. I mean, I got to be honest, I'll just come right out of it. I mean, I was, I had pretty bad diarrhea. Mm-hmm. I've been eating things for 24 hours <laughs> and, you know, and that's embarrassing as heck to, you know, pull over on the roadside and try to find a bush, you know, an olive tree to hide behind. Um, I, you know, under, if that had just been another race, I might've just said, you know what, Th- this is, you know, death before DNF. I mean, this, you know, this is not the occasion to, uh, to keep going, just, you know, um, DNF on this race, come back next year mm-hmm. and, and eat regular food. But that was just not, that, that didn't even cross my mind. Mm-hmm. Like the idea of, of voluntarily stopping if I could keep going didn't even cross my mind. Well, and that really shows it right there. I mean, it's pretty apparent in, in the book. And, and again, I encourage people to take a read because it really, you can feel, you can, I, I can almost imagine being there. Not only have you made me really want to visit Greece, but um, <laughs> you can really like sense exactly what Dean is saying. So I strongly recommend the book. And just one other thing I want to ask you about um, Road to Sparta is, you know, you've done all these events, but at the end of the book, you talk about the anguish and the struggle that every runner, not just yourself, every runner completing a marathon mostly goes through. And you described many things in detail that everyone listening will recognize. So for those of you who see you as the superhuman who doesn't feel pain, um, you know, when they're pushing beyond what their mind thinks they can do, um, maybe tell us about, you know, why, why it is that you, you are out there struggling as well. I mean, you just told us a little bit about the diarrhea struggling with that. Um, but you know, tell us about those feelings that you recognize as well as everyone else. Uh, you know, I just, I think it's, um, shared suffering brings people together. Mm -hmm. And again, I think that, you know, runners are kind of this, um, we're kindred spirits because we go through something that not everyone goes through. It's almost, you know, how people returning from warfare have this, you know, this brotherhood and sisterhood. It just builds bonds. And it doesn't matter if you're an elite athlete like you, you know, just running Olympic, you know, class marathons, uh, or if you're just running your first 5K. Mm -hmm. You know, you go through those same that same emotional cascade, and I think that uniquely binds us. Yep. It, to me, I, you know, there's I there's a lot of athletes that I really look up to, uh, accomplished athletes that they just don't run anymore. I mean, I, you know, I'm a, I'm on the kind of circuit where I go to marathons and ultra marathons and kind of make appearances for sponsors and this and that. I run every single race I go to. And I'm, I'm, an, I'm not the norm. I'm very much an exception. Most of these, you know, quote unquote, celebrity athletes that are no longer, you know, in their competitive prime just show up, you know, make, take some photos, you know, make an appearance mm-hmm. and then fly home. Mm-hmm. I'm like, you know, if you're going to send me to the Boston Marathon, you know, to work the expo, <laughs> I'm running the Boston Marathon. Mm-hmm. You know, any, anywhere you send me, I'm going to participate. I just, I think I have to do it. I could not do it. And I think people maybe respect and admire that. I mean, there's, there's just, there's no way I'm going to run, uh, you know, I'm going to be anywhere competitive in the Boston Marathon. There's no way, but I'm still going to do it. And I think people respect that. Absolutely, for sure. And I, I think that's that's definitely rare in in the kind of level of athlete that you are. And, and thank you for being that person. You know, um, I can say from myself, but also many people listening, that is inspirational. And it also shows that realness in you that you don't see yourself as kind of above it all. You, you just get out there and do it, even if that means, like you said, you finish further down the list. So thank you. Um, okay. So one other thing we wanted to talk about today, um, Marathon Wines, uh, which is a super premium Greek wine. Tell us about what you're doing with Marathon Wines. Um, you know, what does super premium Greek wine mean? And just tell us a bit about what you're up to with that. Yeah. You know, I'll start off by saying that I enjoy wine. <laughs> I'll be <laughs> honest. Um, you know, I enjoy a glass of wine for um, rest and recovery. And I enjoy good wine that, you know, doesn't give me, you know, a headache um, that is, you know, tastes good and that's refreshing. And I met a, a, a gentleman who is 100% Greek from, but he's born in Greece where I'm 100% Greek, you know, born here in America. And he was importing wine from Greece 
and he said, you, you know, you want to get involved and promote my wine. And I looked at his wines and said, I, you know, I do, but I, you know, they're, they're positioned for kind of, you know, foodies and I'm not really a foodie. I'm more of an athlete. Why don't we come out with a, a wine that's specific for athletes, for runners? I mean, if you look through the ancient text by say Herodotus, there's plenty of references to the ancient Olympians drinking wine. I mean, mm-hmm. it's a common practice. Mm-hmm. And, you know, the Greeks in, invented viticulture. So the Greeks were the first winemakers, and the wine in Greece is amazing. It's so good. So he, I said, let's do, a, let's do a label called Marathon. Oh, so you and did choose the up, name. You chose it. Yes. Okay. Yep. And I couldn't believe there wasn't a Marathon wine. Yeah. That we got that. So we got the name. Um, we have, you know, we have a rosé and a white, and they're pretty unique. I mean, um, the white wine comes from this island called Santorini, which is mm. this beautiful windswept Greek island. Um, the thing with the, 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 the grape vines in Santorini is they can't grow straight up like they do in the Napa Valley or anywhere else because the wind blows them down. Mm-hmm. So they, they spin them around in these kind of um, bees nests called calderas. So the, the grapes grow in these, these, these vines that are wound around in little nests that are only about two feet off the ground. Mm-hmm. But the grapes are really good. So, the as I've learned, as I've learned more about wine, um, the flavor in a wine is from the skin of the grapes, not from the interior. So these grapes are very, very small. So they have a higher percentage of of skin mm. to the the kind of pulp. So they're really tasty. As well as um, Santorini is a volcanic island, and the grapes they basically absorb what's in the soil. And yeah. this volcanic soil is very rich in. Um, sodium, potassium, chloride, and magnesium, and you recognize these things, are electrolytes. So the wine is really high in electrolytes, and it's just, it's refreshing and good, and I said, let's do this, and it's good for Greece. You know, the Greek economy right now is yeah. Yeah. Not, a <laughs> not a good place. <laughs> so it's helping Greece, and I love to drink wine. Now I get some, you know, free bar discounted bottles of wine, so I'm happy. <laughs> and you claim, uh, or maybe it's not you that claims, but there's the claim that wine works better for you than ibuprofen. So just to wrap up there, tell us about that. I, you know, that's my belief. I, I used to take a lot of ibuprofen and I stopped. And I, I'll tell you what, I, I recover so much better mm-hmm. now that I don't. Do you take ibuprofen just out of no, curiosity? No, I'm take, yeah. really against a lot of medication. So no, not unless I absolutely, I didn't even have any any um, painkillers when I gave birth to my daughter. I was that stubborn about it. So no. <laughs> I like your style. I like your <laughs> yeah, style. Yeah. So I'm the same way. No, nothing, <laughs> no drugs going in my mouth these days. Nothing at all. And I just, it, I don't know. I, I couldn't, I couldn't pop an ibuprofen again. Uh-huh. Well, I, I mean, I'll, I'll let our listeners test that out for themselves. So on that note, where can it be found? Where can Marathon Wine be found? I think, you know, if you visit the, the website, marathonwine.com, okay. Great. that's the easiest way because you can order online. Okay. Um, you know, in in uh, in retail distribution, we only have a couple locations. We we're just about we're not even six months old. We're about three months old, so we're just right now getting in more and more stores. But um, probably online is the best way to do it. Okay, great. And we, I will put links in the show notes, and we'll talk about all that in a minute. Now, I just have one more question before we get on to the running for a four, which is from uh, one of my Patreon members, Sari, who asked wanted to know how has your age changed your ability to take on these feats over the years? Like, did you notice that you peaked and and then you're struggling, you know, to kind of keep up a bit more, or is age just a number to you? You know, it's it's just a number. Uh, you know, I, it, the, but it, that being said, you know, it, it's, it's to me a number I've got to, it's a reality that I've got to deal with. Mm-hmm. So I work out much harder now than I used to, mm-hmm. uh, especially with cross training. So I really work on keeping, you know, my, my overall fitness, um, pretty at a pretty high level, including, you know, maintaining muscle mass. So I do a lot of cross training. Um, you know, the other thing is that my speed is, is gone. Yeah. You know, I used to be able to run, you know, comfortably run around a three hour marathon. Now, you know, to, to get the, if I was to try to run a, a sub three hour marathon, you know, I'd have to really put some effort into it and do all the speed work and all that sort of stuff. So, you know, your natural speed just, it, mine at least I've noticed has really declined mm-hmm. uh, with every passing year. But that said, I think my endurance is improving mm. and I think my tolerance for pain is improving. And I think my ability to go without sleep is improving. 
So they're trade-offs. <laughs> Sounds like yeah. it. <laughs> yeah, well, you definitely <laughs> described that in the book. Okay, we're just going to take a moment to thank our sponsors and we'll be back with the Running for Real 4. Earlier in the show, I introduced you to our new sponsor, Bombus. You may remember I did a giveaway with Bombus for my birthday week and I've been raving about them on social media. Why? Because I just love them. Two years of research and development led to multiple improvements of the sock design, performance and comfort, including arch support system that gives you extra support where you need it, stay in place technology while not being too loose, and they never leave a mark. And the seamless toe means that there's no more of that annoying bump on your toes. But you want to know the best part. One pair sold is one pair donated. Did you know that socks are the number one most requested item in homeless shelters? But you actually can't donate used socks. That's why Bombas donates one brand new pair of socks for every pair they sell. To date, they've sold and donated over 9 million pairs. Bombas were created for runners, walkers, power lounges, snowboarders, Netflixers, and to me, they feel like you are getting one of those lovely tight squeeze hugs, the ones that just really mean a lot, which I love to give. Some people hate them, but I love them. And here's the bit you want to know. Running for your listeners get 20% off your first order by going to bombas.com forward slash running for real. That's B-O-M-B-A-S dot com forward slash running for real and you'll get 20% off your first order with code running for real with the number four. Are you enjoying these cool mornings? How about the intense workouts that are just as hard as they always were? I don't know about you but I always feel like workouts are going to be somehow easy in the fall after a hot summer but they're still well hard. I still feel beaten up after hard days and after long runs and I still get sore the next day but a less sore when I have body health perfect amino to speed up the recovery process. I take a lot of comfort knowing that it is working hard to repair my muscles as soon as I stop running or strength training. Then I can eat my meal my usual 25 minutes later to fuel up again. I wish I could say I used that time to stretch for enroll, do mobility and rehab but let's be realistic that doesn't always happen. Usually I'm jumping in the shower and trying to get clothes on before Bailey starts crying or I have to do something else on my list. At least I know Body Health Perfect Amino has my back right from the stop of my watch. If you don't believe me, you can try Body Health Perfect Amino with 100% money back guarantee. So if you don't like it or you can't see a difference, you can get your money back. Use coupon code TINA10 for 10% off everything at bodyhealth.com. And if you aren't a fan of the tablets, they also have Perfect Amino XP powder and there's a new mixed berry flavor to try. Remember, code TINA10 will get you 10% off at bodyhealth.com. All right, Dean, just four more questions for you. Starting with, tell us about a photo that maybe is on your social media, maybe it's on your website, maybe it's of the uh, Spartathon of, um, that might not be quite what it seems. It shows something and there, that doesn't show the full story. Wow, that's a, good, that's a really good question. Um, <laughs> you know, there's a, a photo I just saw that was from a, a race, an ultra marathon this weekend that uh, I was running here in Marin, the Headlands 100. And it seems like every photo of me, I'm smiling. And I remember this photo because I just, I just took a really bad spill. So I fell mm. and it banged myself up pretty, pretty good. Uh, really knocked the wind out of myself and kind of got up, dusted myself off, you know, kind of regrouped and kept running. And I thought I was in so much pain at that point. Um, you know, it, it, uh, it was just, a, and it was really shook up. Like I was seeing stars felt like someone punched me in the gut as hard as I mm. could when I hit the ground. And lo and behold, I come around a corner and there's a photographer. He snaps a photo and I looked at this photo and I just look happy go lucky. <laughs> I'm <laughs> smiling. I was like, oh yeah, for a little stroll, you know, in this ultra marathon. Um, but it, it just, it, it was so juxtaposed. I mean, I, I look at this yeah. photo and go, how am I smiling in this photo? But mm-hmm. that was just a very recent um, example of what you asked. Yeah, that's definitely a good example. Thank you for sharing. What about a running for real moment, something that only runners will understand, other than maybe, you know, trying to go to the bathroom behind an olive bush? <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, I mean, this this is, uh, you know, a, a moment that not maybe every runner will understand, but um, I once, I ran for 24 hours on a treadmill in, in Times Square. I can't on even imagine. <laughs> yeah, in Times Square with all the, you know, the plasma screens, filming me running on this treadmill, two stories in the air. And the only thing on the treadmill was the, tre- I mean, the only thing on this uh, platform was the treadmill and this little porta potty, um, like a little camping potty uh, behind the treadmill. 
And, you know, whether I had to go, you know, big potty or little potty, I had to sit down on this thing and pull up this, um, like this umbrella, this 360 degree kind of shower curtain that would come up to hide me. <laughs> Oh, and that was kind of embarrassing, you know, sitting there on a porta potty in front of a hundred thousand people. Yeah. Well, I I thought you were going to say that they didn't give you anything, and you were like, butt was to the to one direction, <laughs> so people would just kind of congregate there. But I'm glad that wasn't the case. No. <laughs> All right. What about a high moment for you in your career? Well, you know, I've run, as we've discussed, I mean, I've run, you know, on all seven continents twice. I've run, you know, across the Gobi Desert. I've run across. Um, you know, Patagonia, incredible places, Namibia. But um, the highlight of my running career was running a 10K. Hmm. And you're probably wondering why a 10K. Yeah, well, not expecting. <laughs> yeah, but I, I ran a 10K with my daughter, Alexandria, on her 10th birthday. Oh. And that was just, I don't know, this is the most special moment for me. I'll, I'm, that Nothing will surpass that moment of That's crossing so the finish cool. line with her hand in hand. Yeah. Oh, I love that so much. All right. And finally, what do you tell yourself when you're in the start line of a race? You know, it's, it's the same thing every start. And that is, um, you know, today you're going to be the best Dean that Dean can be. Mm, you're you're going to, you're going to leave it all on the course. That's it. Your commitment is you're, you're, you're just going to give it your all. That's the best you can do as a human, right? You can just give it your Absolutely. best effort yep. and whether you succeed or fail, if you give it your all, there's no way to fail. I think. Right, no, I totally agree. Thank you so much. I absolutely love that and, and so true and can be applied to anyone. All right, Dean, where can people find out more about you or follow along with any future events that you have going on? Uh, you just Google my name. <laughs> I think that's <laughs> I if, you know, people ask, you know, where do you go? And I'm like, you know, everyone's um, online. Google these days. You, your choice. Yeah, I mean, the Twitter, or, you know, or if you want to follow my Facebook or my Instagram or, or my website, whatever, but yeah, or YouTube. Okay, I will put links in the show notes for everyone. But Dean, thank you so much for being real with us, for sharing your story and just being the incredible inspiration that you are. We truly appreciate it. Well, thanks for having me on. I'm glad you enjoyed The Road to Sparta. And any other um, listeners, if you want to pick up the book, I'd love to hear your feedback because um, a lot of people that are not ultra marathoners have read this book and really enjoyed it. I, I never thought that would be the case. So yeah, no, thank you I for did. your feedback. And I'm not. Yeah. Yep. Thank you so much. So good, right? I believe he is actually one of us, not some superhuman after that interview. I don't know about you. And I hope you enjoyed just how real he was. I love that guests do tend to open up on this podcast. And although I wasn't sure if he would going in, Dean was no exception and he shared a lot with us. I loved how when I asked him at the end how we can find out more, he said, just Google me. And really thinking about it, why do I even ask that? Isn't Googling someone how we all find people nowadays? It's funny that I do actually ask that question and my guests usually give the answers, but really Google probably is the best way to find someone. Anyway, you can find links to everything we talked about today in the show notes, including some information on Deem. So you don't have to Google if you don't want to. I've done the work for you. You can find that at tinamuir.com forward slash episode 81. Now, for those of you who have not heard this podcast before, that is spelled T-I-N-A-M-U-I-R.com forward slash episode 81. Now, in case you wondered what the heck I meant by saying about Patreon members asking their questions, well, Patreon is a support system for you as a fan of my work or a listener to this podcast. So you can give a few dollars, pounds, yen, franc, whatever other currency you have a month, just to show your appreciation for the email newsletters, for the Running For Real Superstars community, for the Instagram inspiration I give my daily Tina For Real podcast, and of course, this podcast. It might not seem like one person could make a difference, but like I read in my doctor's office recently, individually, we are one drop. Together, we are an ocean. How good is that quote? I love it. And it applies here. Every little counts. So thank you from the bottom of my heart to those of you who have already supported me on Patreon. And as you got to hear, you also could ask future guests your questions as well. Now, next week, we have Derek Murphy of Marathon Investigation. And if that sounds familiar, uh, Marathon Investigation is the website that exposes race cheats and people who are pretty much corrupting our sport. Actually, in an earlier interview this year with Amelia Gappin, we heard about the other side of this, how it can actually be quite hurtful and really kind of get people quite down. And in this episode, I asked Derek all about the negativity 
versus the positivity that his website is doing and bringing to the running world. And it's a very interesting interview. So if you haven't already, be sure to subscribe to this podcast through iTunes, Spotify, or your favorite podcast player, and it will come right to you next Friday. So until then, thanks for listening. Have a great week. Thanks for listening to the Running For Real podcast. Be sure to check out tinamuir.com for show notes and even more helpful running information.